Well, good morning, Lighthouse. My name is Brittany Guy. I'm the Executive Arts Director here on staff. And man, it is so good to be with you guys this morning. If this is your first time at Lighthouse, I just wanna say a special welcome. We are so honored that you would take time out of your day to come be part of what Jesus is doing here. And we'd love the opportunity just to connect with you and get to know you a little bit more. So the easiest way you can do that is to text the word LH Connect, all one word, to 24587. We'll send you a text message. You can click on the link, fill out the form, and we'll get connected that way. And if you're watching this live on Sunday morning, after you do that, let us know in the comments that it's your first time here. We'd love just to say hi, say welcome, and answer any questions you have in real time. So welcome. We're so glad you're here. And you know, it's been an absolutely amazing summer here at Lighthouse Church. A couple weeks ago, we had an incredible love week where we just went out into our community and loved like Jesus. This week, our small groups have been wrapping up, and man, it has just been an epic semester in these unprecedented times, hearing stories of how people just came together in their small groups, leveraged technology, and still had that sense of community. And as we continue into the summer, we thought, you know what? Small groups are winding down. Let's change things up a little bit. So starting on August 3rd, for the month of August, we are changing up Growth Track. So Growth Track is now going to be Monday nights, 7 p.m. This is an opportunity while small groups are on break. You can just come check this out. If you want to learn more about Lighthouse Church, learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and learn more about how you can use the gifts that he's given you in his kingdom. Amazing opportunity to do it. Again, it's kicking off Monday, August 3rd, 7 p.m. with our after party. Go to our website, lighthouse.church slash growth track to register. Or if you want to find out more about growth track, all of the information's there. So definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. Well, man, I have a feeling today God is going to do something absolutely incredible. In a few moments, we're going to get kicked off with worship. And again, we have the opportunity to go over to our friends at I-5 and partner with them for worship. So we are going to worship together as one family, one body under one name, and that is the name of Jesus. So if you checked it out last week, worship was absolutely amazing. I know today is going to be the same way. So we're going to come together and worship. And then Pastor John is here with week two of our current series, God of Revival. During this time, we're actually going to take communion. So if you have a couple of seconds before we get kicked off in worship, go gather your elements, get ready for that. Then we're going to close out with another time of worship led by our LH worship team. So before we get started, I just want to take some time to pray and invite God to do what only he can do. So will you pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you so much for today. God, I just thank you for every single person who is watching. Lord, it is not by accident we are here. And God, we just surrender this time to you. Lord, I pray for Pastor John as he comes up to deliver the word that you give him every single word, Lord, that you open up our hearts to receive what you have for us today, God, that we may leave different than when we came in, God. We ask all this in your name, amen. And I search the world but it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise Treasures to fade Never enough Then you came along And put me back together Now every desire Is now satisfied
Your 
promises I take each step with your confidence Cause I am yours I am yours You never fail Your name
Lighthouse, man, what an incredible worship set from our friends at I-5 City Church, as well as Jesse and Corey, two worship leaders from here at Lighthouse. I don't know about you, I have enjoyed that so much, and I'm so grateful about how God is using our two churches together. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you're watching this or whenever you're watching this. We know people watch this different times, different places, different nations. Wherever you're watching this from, I just wanna say welcome. I hope you are having an incredible week. And if there's anything we as a church can do to help you, to serve you, to love you, please do not hesitate to let us know. Let us know in the comments or if you're watching this later in the week, please uh, shoot us an email, reach out. We truly wanna serve you however we can. That said, I, I wanna welcome our watch parties. Uh, first and foremost, our Glen Burnie watch party as a number of people gather together to watch this service together. Big shout out to Glen Burnie and to those of you that are hosting watch parties in your home all over our state and other places as well. Uh, if you're interested in hosting a watch party, man, go for it. Grab some friends, grab some family, gather together, let us know. Uh, as we've said many, many times, social distancing should not and cannot mean social isolation. We were created in the image of a relational God, which means you were designed for community. And so we're trying to facilitate that absolutely any way we can. Watch parties is a huge, huge part of that. That said, we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of a series called God of Revival. This is week two, and I'm calling it The Problem in America. But before we get into that, if you wouldn't mind pausing and joining me in a word of prayer. Jesus, please uh, be with us this morning. Thank you for everything you do in us, through us, for us. And we really believe that in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you were the God of revival. And we believe now today, in 2020, you still are the God of revival. So would you speak to us, not just as a church, but I ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us individually, speak to us in a special way, in a unique way. For those watching Jesus, you know, those that need to be encouraged, those that need to be challenged, those that need to be told simply, hey, you can, you can take one more step. I pray you provide us what we need so that we can act more like you, talk more like you, live more like you, love more like you, and extend hope to the world around us that so desperately needs more of you. Please be with us, Jesus. In your name we pray these things. Amen. So uh, when Mary and I, my wife Mary and I, first got married, uh, we rented a house in a brand new community. And a family in that community that we were very close to um, started to have some issues in their new home right after they moved in. They'd only been in their house a couple months and they started to notice that there was actually uh, a smell or an odor in the basement. It smelled a little uh, damp or mildewy, something like that. And because their house was only a couple months old, uh, they called the builder, who then promptly sent a plumber to examine what was going on. So the plumber walked the property and checked it out. And his diagnosis was, hey, that there's a lot of construction going on, and what's happened is silt and uh, little bits of dirt from the construction has found its way into your sump pump. So don't worry about it. There's been a lot of rain recently. Just hold steady, and eventually that's going to go away. So that's what they tried to do. Then a few more months went by, and that smell persisted, and uh, so they called the plumber again. Uh, a new plumber came, a little higher up in the company, came out. He walked around, and he told them to take a little bit of bleach and pour it into their sump pump. He said that just because of that dirt, maybe some bacteria had gotten into the sump pump and what would happen? If it was disinfected, the problems would go away. Um, a few more months went by. The problems persisted. In fact, they got worse. So they called the company again. They sent a, a different plumber out. This time, the guy took a look. He sealed all around the sump pump. He thought, hey, that's going to take care of this problem. This went on and on and on for several months, almost to the point of a year, until finally the couple called a uh, plumber that was outside the building company. And he came and took a look at it and led them to realize that the problem was actually much bigger than they had originally anticipated. That they had looked at all these various issues and, and thought, maybe it's the sump pump, maybe it's the silt, maybe it's this or that. But this plumber had essentially led them to discover that the problem was not the silt, the problem was not the sump pump, the problem was not that it needed to be sealed. The problem was that when they had built 
the house, the contractors had mixed up the sewage line with the radon pipe. Now, if you don't know what a radon pipe, that's a pipe that essentially just goes under the foundation of the house to allow any gas to escape from underneath the foundation. So what had been happening for the entirety of the time that the family had lived in that house was that all the wastewater and all the sewage had not gone out into the sewer. It had, in fact, been going underneath the house. And so this, of course, caused the couple <laughs> to freak out, as you can imagine. It caused the building company to really freak out. And they tripped over to themselves to promise, hey, we're going to do all types of remediation. Don't worry. It's not going to be a problem. But in my conversations with that family from our neighborhood, it was strange to see that as they had sort of gone through all these lists of problems of what the issue could be, even though the actual problem was worse than anything they had anticipated, there was a level of relief simply in knowing what the problem was. And because they knew what the problem was, they were able to move to the solution. If I could use that simply as an analogy to expand upon our present situation, I want to ask a question. Maybe it's a question that you've pondered, like myself, over the past few weeks, months, maybe even years. And the question is, what is the problem in America? Maybe you've looked at the news. Maybe you've looked at social media. Maybe you've looked in your own family or friend group, and you've wondered, man, what is the problem. I'm sure your friends, your family, your, your coworkers have suggested a variety of different answers to that question. Here's a few of the most popular. What's the problem with America? Some people would say uh, we're too divided. The problem in America is that we're too divided. And then oftentimes there's an attempt to explain why we're so divided. Well, it's the media that exacerbates things, or uh, it's politicians or politics in general, or it's fake news. But regardless of what the cause is, the problem is we're divided. Other people would step in and say, no, the problem is not that we're divided. The problem in America is injustice. And they might use that either on a personal level or a corporate and systemic level, but they'd say, no, the problem, the reason why we're divided is because there is injustice. And so the problem in America is injustice. We don't treat everybody as the image of God. Others would then step in and say, no, that, that's not the main problem. The main problem is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy that, that people will point out problems in others, but they won't address it in themselves. And so that then leads to injustice, which then leads to division. The problem is hypocrisy. Others, more practically practical minded, will step up and say, no, it's, it's a very pragmatic problem. It's a systems problem. We need to fix either our economy or this system or that system. We need to reform it. And if we could just make a few tweaks, then the problems would fade away. I'd like to submit to you that while all those issues are important and all of those need to be discussed and all of those merit their own level of attention, none of those are the problem in America. I, I would argue that those are in fact symptoms of the problem in America. But as we're in a series on revival, you might say, why, the, why is this so important? Because as we discuss revival, you have to understand the problem if you're to fully realize and understand the solution. Put another way, if we don't understand what the problem is, we'll find ourselves pouring bleach into the proverbial sump pump when reality there is sewage going underneath the foundation of the house. And so it's paramount that we understand what the problem in America is. And forgive me for being uh, America-centric. I know there's those that tune in from other nations. We have people from the UK and Japan and countries in Africa. And so uh, if you're watching from another nation, I'm going to speak from my experience, and hopefully that can apply to your experience as well. But to answer that question, what is the problem in America? I want to turn to a book of the Bible that maybe you haven't read for a while. It is the book of Ezekiel. That in some ways, Ezekiel faced a situation that was very, very different from ours. In other ways, his situation was very similar to the circumstances that we see right now. Here's the background to the book of Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel lived in Israel during a time that Israel had abandoned their covenant with God, with Yahweh, and instead had worshiped idols. Remember, an idol is anything that takes God's place in your heart. So an idol is usually good things that then become God things, good things that then take the center of your heart and mind and push God out of his rightful place. So Israel had given themselves over to idols, and in so doing, they had relinquished God's divine protection. So God then allowed Israel to be taken captive by the nation state of Babylon, and Babylon had hauled off a large percentage of the Israelites back to Babylon to resettle them. And Ezekiel, the prophet, and uh, in the lineage of the priesthood, was one of these captives, one of these uh, taken to Babylon. And so he's in Babylon. It's his, he's 30 years old. This is when he would have begun his service in the temple in Jerusalem as a priest, but he's in another nation. His identity has been stripped away. The world feels like it's turned upside down. Israel is extremely divided, not only physically, literally divided, but there was different solutions that abounded. Their, their systems were broken. Their economy was in shambles. Their political system was crazy. There was hypocrisy like you would not believe. And it's into this situation that God begins to speak to the prophet Ezekiel. And as he sits in exile in Babylon, God begins to give him visions that were not just for him, but for the nation of Israel and visions that we can glean from today. What God said to Ezekiel is essentially, hey, there's a, there's a myriad of problems going on in Israel. But the problem is that you've walked away from me. And the problem is that you've abandoned me for idols. And the problem is sin. And then he distills it all down to one idea. Really, it's the hinge of the book of Ezekiel. He says, you wanna know what the problem is, Ezekiel? Israel has hard hearts. And then he actually, the phrasing he uses is, Israel has hearts of stone. That's the problem. He says, Israel has hearts of stone. And because God makes this the centerpiece of the book of Ezekiel, and not only that, but he uses this theme multiple times throughout not only Old Testament, but also the New Testament, because that idea is important to God, it should be important to us as well. And so before we just launch into what comes next, I wanna peel back that idea. What does it mean to have a heart of stone? Charles Spurgeon, the famous English preacher and pastor, said, really, to to have a heart of stone, it means two things. Number one, a heart of stone is cold. If you've ever walked uh, on on a kitchen tiled floor in the dead of winter with no socks on, you know what I'm talking about. That stone, left to its own devices, is cold. So what does a cold heart look like? A cold heart is not thankful you can give it an enormous amount of blessings. You can put a cold heart in the richest nation in the world, arguably during the most prosperous time in world history, and it will still find reasons why it can complain. Cold heart is not hopeful. It looks out in the world and it's cynical and sarcastic. Cold heart is not compassionate. It's quick to find reasons why compassion is not required in this situation or in that situation. And God looks at a heart like that and goes, that's a cold heart, that's a heart of stone. Not only that, not only is a heart of stone cold, but obviously a heart of stone is also extremely hard. What do I mean by that? I mean a heart of stone, number one, it's not teachable. You can't show someone with a hard heart anything. People with hard hearts, they don't don't listen because they only listen if they think they can learn something that will help their argument. They never listen to understand. They never listen to love. And so most of the time they go through life simply waiting for their opportunity to speak. That's a hard, hard heart. They don't change if you have a hard heart. You're, You're not moved Maybe you're, you're affected by a topic, by a sermon, by a song for a little bit, but it doesn't lead to any life change. Why? Because your heart is hard and so it's not pliable. In the church, one of the best ways you could tell you have a hard heart is if every sermon is a great fit for somebody else. 
so you know, man, maybe, maybe I have a hard heart. God looks at Israel and he goes, of all the problems, the problem at the root of it is that you have hearts of stone. In church, I'd like to argue that the problem in America is that we have hard hearts. You might say, man, I, now I think the problem is we can't listen to each other. We can't listen to each other because we view the other side, whatever the other side is, as ground to be taken rather than people to be loved. That's a sign of a hard heart. Ah, we're so hypocritical. Yeah, we're hypocritical because hard hearts are experts at pointing out the problem in someone else and never turning the mirror on themselves. Oh, man, we're so angry. Yeah, we're so angry because compassion never breaks through the shell of a hard heart. And so we just get angrier and angrier and angrier. Why, what you might say, man, I feel like truth has fallen by the wayside. Yeah, truth has fallen by a wayside because hard hearts are simply listening for their opportunity to make their opinion known. And so truth really doesn't have a place for those with hard hearts. And can I just say, I, that's not just the problem in America. That's the problem everywhere. That's the problem with you. And that's the problem with me because our default mode is to have hearts that are cold and hearts that are hard. Our natural tendency is to have hearts of stone. Before we move on, let me just ask a question. On a scale of one to 10, how hard would you say your heart is? Do you lean more towards cynicism or hope? Do you tend to be more grateful or more critical? Do you find yourself feeling compassionate or are you more quick to justify reasons why compassion isn't needed in this situation? See, once we recognize what the problem is, we can then move on to the solution. God tells Israel, the problem is that you have hearts of stone. And then he goes on to say this in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says, so I will take you out of the nations and I'll gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and then you'll be clean. And I'll cleanse you from all the impurities and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart. And I will put in you a new spirit. And I will remove your heart of stone. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. And my spirit, I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. God says to Ezekiel to the nation of Israel. He says, the problem is that you have hard hearts. He said, and so the solution is you need to elect some new leaders. <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. He, he criticizes Israel's leaders, but that's not the solution. He says, the problem is you have, you have hard hearts. And so the solution is, man, you need more rules. You need more laws. That's not what he said. Israel had more than six hundred laws in the Old Testament, and they had left those by the wayside because they had hard hearts. God says, hey, the problem is you have a hard heart, and the solution is we got to get people back to the temple. We got to get people back to church. No, actually, he criticized the temple, and he talked about the temple. That wasn't his solution. He might say, all right, John, I see what you're doing. What's the solution? God says, the solution. The problem is you have a hard heart. The solution is I'm going to give you a new one. The problem is you have a heart of stone. The solution is I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. You see, when you realize what the problem is, it changes the way you see the world. When you realize what the problem is, and what the accompanying solution is, it changes your whole worldview. This is why this is so important. 
Because when you see the problem in our nation, not as a problem of practicality and not as a problem of elections and not as a problem of, man, if we could just change this one thing or make this one tweak or shift this one thing, when you see the problem as it's our hard hearts, it changes the way you view the world and it changes the way you live. And I want to say it changes the way you live in three distinct ways. When you see the problem is hard hearts and the solution is God giving a new heart, number one, what that creates in us is it creates a desperation. And I know we talked about this last week, but this is a theme that's going to keep coming up. When you realize that the problem is an inside problem, not an outside problem, it changes your approach. Can I tell you real quick, a few things that cannot change hard hearts a few things, let me just list a few things that cannot change hard hearts. Number one is elections. That if I could just maybe <laughs> prophesy for a minute, I bet over the next few months, both sides of the aisle, whichever aisle, side of the aisle you find yourself on, I'm going to guess that both sides of the aisle are going to try to convince you and me that if the other side gets elected, it's the end of the world. That's what that's, that's, that's the tactic in our day and age. So, hey, you can't, you can't, they can't win. I bet they're going to try and convince you. Can I tell you something? No matter who gets elected, hard hearts don't change. Elections don't change hard hearts. Are they important? Absolutely. Is it a central part of our democracy and our republic? Absolutely. Should effort and thought and time go into it? Definitely. Does it change hard hearts? Absolutely not. Elections don't change hard hearts. You know what else doesn't change hard hearts? Is education. Facts, knowledge, perspectives. This is why, to this day, I don't think I've ever seen someone's mind change through a Facebook argument, despite all the information that's thrown. Hey, check out this link, check out this video, look at this. You know why? Because education doesn't change hard hearts. That's like trying to change someone from the outside in. God said, no, no, no. This is an inside out type of job. Education doesn't change. You know what else doesn't change hard hearts? Is effort effort, just trying, trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, trying to get up earlier and stay up late. That doesn't change the inside you. Let me just show you what I mean. This is a, maybe it's a little bit of a silly illustration, but I want you to do as you're watching this is I want you to just make a fist in front of you. I want you to squeeze it as hard as you can. And if you feel that, regardless of how hard you're squeezing it right now, I guarantee you a week from now, you're still not going to be making that fist. No matter how much effort you put in now, it's not going to make a difference a week from now. You know why? Because we cannot change our own heart through sheer effort. I can't even change my own heart, let alone my neighbor's heart. Effort does not change the inside of us. And so if elections doesn't change or effort doesn't change, and by the way, these aren't bad things. These are good things. They're just not the type of, th of things that provide the radical change that we need with people with hard hearts. If those things don't provide the change, you might say, what provides the change? Or who provides the change? God says, I do. I provide that change. Which is why when you look at the book of Ezekiel, I'm just going to reference the verses that we just read, so it's not going to go up on the screen. Listen to what God says. God said, for I will take you out of the nations, and I will gather you from other countries, and I will sprinkle you with clean water, and I will cleanse you, and I will give you a, a new heart, and I will give you a new spirit, and I will remove your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. You know who's active in that? God. I, I, I. You know who's passive? Us. That doesn't mean that we don't do anything. That doesn't mean that we don't have a part to play. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to not look at our resources, our time, and our talent, and our energy, and say, God, what would you have me do? It simply means nothing from the outside can change you. Only God can change the inside you. God's saying, I change people. I shift people. I take hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh. And when you realize that's the problem, that's a solution, it creates a desperation because you look at the world and you go, God, I cannot change this. So I need you to move. I cannot change me. So I need you to move. And it changes the way you live. And it changes your priorities. 
You know what else it changes? It changes the way you treat people, which is why not only does it lead to desperation, but it also leads to compassion. I love this uh, verse from the life of Jesus. Matthew chapter nine, verse 36. It says, when Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Mark tells us that when Jesus did this, he was actually trying to get away from people and the people had found him. He'd had a long day and the people had found him and he looks out and he's moved with compassion. And let me just say, uh, it's easy for us to kind of go, yeah, well, that's Jesus. Like he didn't have to live, you know, in 2020. Just know, Jesus had a really clear-eyed view of people. Scripture says that Jesus loved people, but he didn't entrust himself to everybody because he knew the heart of man. And I'm sure Jesus looking out at that crowd knew there were people in that crowd that would chant crucify him as he was dying. Nevertheless, Jesus looks out at this crowd and his heart breaks and he has compassion because he goes, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Their hearts are hard and, and they don't even know. And so he has compassion. Can I just ask, when you look out at our culture, do you, do you just get angry and you talk about, I can't believe these people are doing, I can't believe this, I can't believe, do you look out and just get angry or do you look out and does your heart break? I think about Jesus and the rich young ruler. If you're not familiar with the story, this guy comes to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's a young guy, rich guy. He comes to Jesus. He's so arrogant. He's so pompous. He's so vain. He actually assumes he's figured it out and he's come to Jesus basically just to get validation. Jesus says, you have to keep all the commandments. And the guy says, I've done that. I've kept all 600 of the laws. I am morally perfect. And Jesus looks at him and could have cut him down so quickly, could have listed every sin he's ever committed. Instead, it says, instead it says Jesus looks at him and loves him as if to say, your heart is so hard and it's gonna hurt you so bad. So Jesus says, man, you have to sell everything that you have. And the guy can't do it because his heart's too hard. But Jesus still loves him. One thing I, I just, it's just been on my heart over the past few weeks is when I talk to Christians or I get on social media, it seems like Christians are so angry right now. And I understand it. Hear me. Sin should make us angry. Sin makes God angry. God is a God of justice and sin makes him angry. But sin should also break our hearts because sin breaks people. And if you look at principles, you can get really angry. But if you look at people, you should be heartbroken. And when we look out in culture, we shouldn't see, man, those Republicans or those Democrats or this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. We should look out and go, man, our hearts are so hard. And it should cause compassion. And it should cause desperation. And lastly, it should cause humility. What does it cause when you realize that the problem is a hard heart and the solution is God giving a new heart? It should cause humility. In the book of Hebrews, it says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, to fully understand that passage, you have to understand how God answered that promise. He promised Ezekiel and he promised Israel, the day will come that I will give you a new heart and I will give you a new spirit. That promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost that Jesus told his disciples and stay in Jerusalem. They had seen him die on the cross. They had seen him raised to life. They had seen him ascend into heaven and he promised, I will send my spirit. And then on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit dwelled within them. What that means for you and I is that if you are a follower of Jesus, meaning you don't just intellectually believe, but you have surrendered your life for him. You recognize he paid for your sins on the cross. So you're not trying to earn your way to God. You realize you couldn't get to God. So God 
God came to you, and now you've surrendered your life to follow him. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If that's you, God's Holy Spirit now lives inside of you. You have a new heart. You have a new spirit. And so there's things that bother you now that didn't used to bother you. They prick your conscience that didn't used to prick your conscience. He leads you, and he guides you, and he directs you. That's what it means to have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's an absolute miracle. What it goes to show is what you and I need is not a new coat of paint and not a few tweaks and not, man, I'm gonna change some behavior. What it shows is that God had to remake you from the ground up, new heart, new spirit, new person. That's the promise. But what happens sometimes is maybe you make a decision to follow Jesus and you're filled with this fire initially. And then over time, that heart that God made so soft and so tender, that listened for his voice, that conscience that was so easily offended, what happens is it starts to become calloused and that heart starts to become calcified. And it doesn't go all the way back to a heart of stone. It can't. God's given you a brand new heart. But it's not as soft as it used to be. And it doesn't hear him as clearly as it used to. And it's not as compassionate and it's not as much like Jesus as it used to be. That's why Hebrews says, even if you're a believer and God's given you a new heart, don't let your heart get hard again through sin and its deceitfulness. Now, maybe you're watching this and um, you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you just stumbled across this video somehow or some friend invited you or maybe you've been attending Lighthouse for a while and you're just sort of kicking the tires to see what you see what you believe, but you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus. But now it's impressed upon you that you realize I do need a new heart. My heart is hard, it's cynical, it's cold, it's ungrateful, it's not hopeful, and I need God to give me a new heart. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that in a second. Or maybe you're watching this and you are a follower of Jesus but you just realize that that heart that God made so soft and so tender has become hardened by the events, by the decisions, and by the things happening in this world. Wherever you find yourself, the catalyst to a softer heart is the same. And the catalyst is repentance. Repentance can sound like a really sort of big theological word, but all repentance means is telling God, I'm, I'm sorry, not just for my actions. I'm sorry for my heart. And I'm sorry, not just because there's consequences for my actions. I'm sorry that my heart broke your heart, God. That's true repentance. To say, I'm sorry for what I've done. And I want to live in such a way, I want to live differently. Repentance is really the practice of the Christian life by which we're renewed. Repentance is the way we clear the air for anything that comes between us and God. Repentance is how you keep your heart in a world that'll make you so hard and so cold, like, like rock hard hearts. In a world like that, repentance is how you keep your heart tender, and soft to listen to the voice of God. In fact, it's so important that repentance is one of the cornerstones of uh, one of the practices given to us by Jesus. It's called different things in different churches. Some call it communion. Others call it the Lord's Supper. Some people call it the Eucharist. Um, but it was a practice that was started by Jesus and his disciples that Jesus took a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine on the night before he was crucified. The bread symbolizes his body that was about to be broken on the cross. The juice symbolizes his blood that was poured out on that cross as he died. And so communion is a reminder of the price that was paid for your forgiveness. Communion is a reminder of why when we repent to God and say, I was wrong, communion is why we know God says you're forgiven. Communion is why we know God says you can come home. Communion is why we know that God is a good father and his arms are open wide because Jesus died so that you could be welcomed home. Jesus was excluded so that you could be welcomed in. 
Jesus, though he was innocent, suffered so that you and I who are guilty could be forgiven. Now, here's what I ask. Um, as you're gathering supplies to take communion in your own house, um, maybe you get a little bit of bread or a little bit of juice or something like that, whatever works for you. Um, I, I want to lead us in two prayers before we take communion together as a family. The first prayer is for those that you've never followed Jesus, but you want to make a decision to follow him here and now. The second prayer is for those that you are a follower of Jesus, but maybe, like all of us, your heart has just gotten a little hardened, a little calcified, and a little calloused. And you want to return to where it was when you first started following him. Here's what I would ask is uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, um, feel no pressure to take communion at this time. Actually, we'd appreciate it is if those who are not followers of Jesus would hold off, not because we want to be exclusive. Communion is not good luck. It's not magical powers. It's simply a reminder for those that follow Jesus, the price that was paid so that we could enter into his family, the price that was paid so that you and I could have new hearts. And so I'm going to lead us in two prayers, and then we're going to take communion together. Let's pray. If you're not a follower of Jesus, but you'd like to become a follower right now, you can repeat after me, either in your own home or in your own heart. Jesus, I recognize that my heart is so hard. And I recognize I've tried to do things my way rather than your way. And I've recognized that the words I've said and the things I've thought and the things I've done in the state of my heart has broken your heart. And so I'm sorry. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross so that I could be forgiven. Would you forgive me now? I surrender my life to you. Would your Holy Spirit come into my heart? Would you remove my heart of stone? Would you give me a heart of flesh? Would you take out my old disposition and give me a new spirit? Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me and help me live like you from, from here on out. In your name we pray these things, amen. Maybe you're just a Christian that's realized your heart has gotten harder over the past few weeks or months or years. I wanna lead you in a prayer as well. Jesus, thank you for dying so that my heart could be made new. Forgive me for allowing my compassion and my fire and my joy in my peace to ebb away. Please, Jesus, would you peel back the layers of my heart? Would you freshen it and soften it just like it was on the day when I first started to follow you? Help me to be the type of person that reflects your love. Help me to hear the still small voice of your Holy Spirit. Help me to be compassionate and caring and loving. Help me to live like you. Jesus, forgive me, help me, strengthen me. In your name, we pray these things, amen. Now we're gonna take communion together. The Apostle Paul writes, for I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus took a piece of bread and breaking it, he told his disciples, I'm gonna be broken so that your hard heart can be made new. And then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. The apostle Paul said, after dinner, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Listen, I know we've talked about some heavy things today. 
And maybe you need some time to pause or to pray, or maybe you need time to reflect, or maybe you need someone to talk to. I just want you to know our church family is here to reach out to you. But I think the best time and the best way that we can end a sermon like that, talking about such a serious topic, is through worship. Because in worship, we are singing praise to the God that loved us so much he came on a rescue mission for us. In worship, we're reminded that in every way we fall short, Jesus exceeds. Where we run out of compassion, he never does. When we run out of joy, he never does. When, he run, when we run out of peace, he never does. And in fixing our eyes on him, we're strengthened and we're encouraged and we're propelled forward to love people and to live how Jesus lived. To walk not with hearts of stone, but with hearts of flesh. And so I'd encourage you to take this closing song of worship, to focus on your Savior, to examine your own heart, and to walk closer and closer with Him. Let me close this out in prayer, and then we'll end in worship. Jesus, wherever we find ourselves today, we know that our hearts fall so far short. Would you please speak to us? Would you please minister to us? And would you please change us from the inside out so that we can be what we need to be to point people in our nation closer to you? We don't wanna be part of the problem, Jesus. We wanna be part of the solution. We don't wanna have hard hearts. We wanna have soft hearts that hear your voice, that love people, and that walk how you walked, that live how you lived. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen.
man, what an incredibly powerful word, an incredibly powerful message. And I just wanna say, if you prayed that prayer that Pastor John led us in and became a follower of Jesus today, congratulations, welcome home. That is the best decision you will ever make. And we wanna know about it. We wanna know that you made that decision. We wanna come alongside of you, pray with you, and also get you some resources. So if you became a follower of Jesus today, make sure you send us an email, info at lighthouse.church. You can call the office. We just wanna come alongside of you, celebrate with you, and again, just welcome you home into the family. So that's so amazing. We're so glad that you made that decision today. Thank you guys for being with us. We've loved having you here. And I just wanna say a special thank you to all of you who financially partner with us. We could not do this week in and week out without your financial giving. And we are just so grateful that you partner with us in that way. We love you guys so much. We can't wait to see you back here next week. Have an incredible week.